Well, welcome everyone. Hello. Hi. Hello. Um, my name is Darlene, and I'm uh, I'm an organizer with Democracy NC. Um, so thanks for coming tonight. This is a uh, it's called What's What's on Your Ballot. Um, so basically, what we're going to do tonight is um, just go through an educational activity. Um, this, especially, you know, since this is a smaller group, you can kind of take this as like a train the trainer. Um, are folks here involved with different organizations in this area? Yeah, can maybe, so maybe we can just start by um, in a minute going around um, and you know just saying our name um, and um, any groups that you may you know work with in the area. Um, but um, what we're going to do is go through uh, this this workshop exercise that basically is an interactive way to learn. Um, not only what is on the ballot, but what those positions do. And it's kind of, a, it, it ends up being, it's kind of like a matching game that we'll play. So you see we put some of the different positions that are on the ballot up on the wall. Um, so, you know, I encourage y'all to just think of this as like a train the trainer in a way, something that you can take with you uh, and even repeat in a different setting. You know, if that makes sense. Obviously, we have the primary coming up here quickly, uh, but then in the general as well, um, this is, you know, kind of a skill set you can hang on to. So. Um, so does anyone want to go introduce yourself? I'm Dan Perlmutter, uh, associated with the Democratic Party, NAACP, and various and sundry other organizations. <laughs> <laughs> Marshall Lee Baker. Um, primarily, the, uh, most of my introduces is going to the Jackson County branch of NAACP today, but. We're joined at the hip with uh, the other, well, um, the, uh, I'll let this group say the name of your multi-alphabetical multi, multi soup name. <laughs> okay, that's it. I go by Marshall Lee. Everybody knows that except I'm so glad y'all must be from college, from the university. Good. I hope it's because we were doing voter registration and passed out little notes about this to invite y'all. Just say yes, maybe you could. <laughs> Uh, my name's Patsy. I'm, uh, just here to find out what's going on. Joan Parks. Um, I'm part of Indivisible Common Ground, OFA, WNC, and also NAACP. I'm Lauren Baxley, and I'm also part of Indivisible Common Ground. I'm Betsy Swift, um, Indivisible Common Ground. Whitney, I'm a dietetic intern, friends with Katie, um, but I affiliate Democrat, so I feel like this is really important, so I'm here. I'm Katie, I'm here to support the receptor to find out what's going on. <laughs> well, I found out today that Katie has not voted before, so I told her that she needs to come. <laughs> Um, I'm Nilifa Couture, and I'm also with Indivisible Common Ground OFA and um, with the NAACP and other organizations and happy to be here. <laughs> and I'm happy to be here, and the Democrats. My name is Enrique Gomez. I am president of the Jackson County NAACP, and um, I am also faculty at Western. I'm currently responsible for this thing not being projecting presently, but Hopefully, it will come up in just a moment. <laughs> it will come up, okay. I'm being optimistic. I'm being very optimistic. Is it a sample ballot? Craig, I'm sorry. Yes. You have to come in here and sit down. <laughs> <laughs> sample ballot? I don't, I don't like to stay at the hour. Oh, I don't say the whole hour. Huh? This is uh, a form called what's on the I was, you guys won't think I'm rude if I get up late. No, no, no. no, 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 no they're okay. <laughs> That's what you're going to do too. <laughs> yeah, and it's your turn to say what you did. Okay. <laughs> okay. You can't have a vision. I'm going to my life. No, I could. You were kind of blurry. Uh -huh. uh, what is your name? My name's Greg. Greg, cool. Hey, And welcome. I've been getting emails from you. Okay, cool. <laughs> and hey, I didn't, but I didn't. Uh, RSVP. Well, that's okay. 
it's Welcome. working now. So you awesome. Thank slide. you. So we do have PowerPoint. We would have been okay without it. Uh, but does there, does everybody have a um, have a pencil and a sticky note? Yes. yes. Cool. Yes. So if you wouldn't mind pulling that out, and if you don't have one, um, if you could just take a second to write um, why voting matters in your community this year, things that you're thinking about with the upcoming election, uh, certain issues, or um, just kind of what motivates you. And if you can just take a quick minute to write that down, we'll have a little sharing period with our with our partner. Uh, oh, I have a pencil. I just need to stick. Oh, okay. There you go. Thank you. You're welcome. Instead of doing it with partners, we can just do it with the groups too. It'll be good. Would anybody like to share? Um, yeah, we, we care who the judges are going to be because they're going to be in office for a really long time. I looked before. Okay. Be okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the judges, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. You know, there's not a primary right for the judges. That was changed. Uh, what else? Any specific issues or anything at all? I think saving the social safety nets in general is. So safety nets or. Like healthcare, social security, education, all of those things that mm -hmm. um, are being threatened. Our social programs, okay. So we can uh, <coughs> elect people who um, support our view. County Commission makeup. So you worried about zoning and stuff like that? Environment. Environment. Well, that's why you'd be concerned about the county commissioners and people zoning stuff, right? People allowing you all sorts of crap. Living wages for people. Living wages. Yeah, I was at a living wage coalition meeting today. All right. Immigration. Immigration. Okay. Anybody else want to throw anything else out there? Oh, down here. Women's rights. Women's rights. Education. All right. There we go. All right. So we've got a pretty full list here, right? Um, a lot of these things were said last night, you know. Um, a few of them were not. But um, all of these things are valid, right? We're going to talk tonight about... Um, oh, hey. Oh, we just Hi. got started. Welcome. Good. What's your name? Sylvia. Sylvia, smile. Hello, Darlene. Uh, thanks for coming. Thank so um, we just wrote on sticky notes reasons why people um, think voting is important in the upcoming election, and wrote some of them up here. Um, just kind of using this as a base to get started, so we all know the different issues that are on each other's radar in here. Um, so I think we can go to the next slide. So you know all of these issues as people meander their way uh, to the voting box. This image is supposed to kind of show uh, voting is this, is this thing that you know, we're, we're told we're supposed to do. We hear about it sometimes, but when it comes to actually doing it, it's like, am I going to make it? Am I going to fall in when I, when I go there? Uh, there's so many different things that, uh, that prevent people from making it to the ballot box beyond just you know, voter suppression tactics um, that we see here in North Carolina. Uh, there's just a lot of confusion about how all these issues connect to voting um, in everyday life, right? And uh, why it should be a priority for folks. So the whole point of this presentation is just to talk a little bit more uh, about voting, uh, why it matters, 
um, you know, in, in certain contexts. So if you so um, remembering the you know the historic struggles that have happened for voting, a lot of times that's kind of used as a reason, right? People people died for your right to vote, um, which is true. Uh, but a lot of times, especially in Western North Carolina, just you know, to be clear and to be honest, a lot of times we do have white people working with people of color in spaces to talk, you know, around voter registration, um, and we want people to have a little bit of a, a deeper dive um, beyond, you know, saying some of those things. You know, you just you have to vote. You know, people died for your right to vote. Um, going a little bit deeper, um, and uh, if we can go to the next slide. Um, than just some of those things. We want y'all to understand a few things, right? And so voting is, is about power. Um, we're gonna talk about voting in, uh, in the context of power um, because it's especially true at, at local levels, right? Um, I mean, we have tons of money that, that comes in and influences elections. We have dark money, we have soft money, <laughs> we have hard money, all the secret money, right? Uh, but especially at the local level, um, it, it's, there's still money involved, right? But it's significantly less, right? So we tend to have races that are more uh, relatable, or right? people may know the family name of the person that's gonna be on the ballot, or they may actually you know, know who the person is. Um, but you know, voting, uh, voting really is about, the, not, it's about power, and there's three different ways that we wanna talk about um, what that power is. So the first is the power to choose, right? Um, so a lot of times people feel like, oh, for example, with, with the latest presidential election, people felt like, I don't want to choose either of them, right? And did anybody here in here feel like that personally? A lot of people did, okay? And, and so it's understandable. Um, so again, reminding people that especially in our more local elections, not just the state level, but here, you know, with, with the county commission um, and the sheriff, this is a chance for people to really have a big a, a big say in who's going to be representing and running, you know, their their local show. Um, it's an opportunity to get to know these people a little a little better personally, because who they are personally is going to have an impact on the way they use their power, right, and the way they run the politics in the community. So when we go through our little story and some of the things we're going to do, um, we'll talk about that stuff a little a little bit more. Can you add the next slide? Um, and this is just a fun fact here, uh, just to kind of help you as you're talking to folks. Uh, does anybody want to read that for us? Popcorn. In 31 North Carolina cities, one person cast a deciding vote to pick the winner. Right? So we did research that found this uh, in the 2015 election, right? Um, so, you know, similar to this year. Um, so that's just something to know, too. Uh, the power to choose is real. So, um, uh, so um, was it local Silva two years ago? There was an election that was decided by a contest toss because it was equal number of people voting. Yeah. Was it for, for a city council? Wow. Well, a coin toss. A coin toss, 50 yeah. 50. Equal number yeah. of votes. Didn't that happen in the House of Representatives up in Virginia or West yeah. Virginia? Yeah, just this year. Either the House of Representatives or Governor. So the more people get out, the <laughs> hopefully the less likely that may happen. But we don't know. But um, and so if we can go to the next slide, uh, so, so that's one, the power to choose. The next is, is the power to influence, right? Um, so if we can go to the next slide. Um, influence also often comes down to numbers, right? So showing, showing strength in numbers um, and having, having a consistently engaged voting block is how um, you can really influence politicians, right? So there's the power to choose, right? There's the power to influence. And then the third type of uh, power that we'll talk about with the next slide is the power to hold accountable, right? So first, you're going and trying to choose who you'd like to see in power, influencing them to go along with you know, what you would hope they would do in your community. Um, and then there's holding them accountable. So if you can go to the next slide, um, a lot of times this is when we show folks the door, right? Say if you're, you know, you ran on a certain platform and you're not delivering, or you just made a decision that was really poor and you, you know, won't take responsibility for it. Um, this is where the people power that we saw in the previous slide comes into play and in showing folks the door. Um, so the thing that connects all of this um, is that, and, and this is a story I'll share with y'all in just a minute, um, there's a lot of there's a lot of barriers to voting, right? There's there's gerrymandering, there's money in politics, and there's voter suppression. But those three powers 
um, that we just talked about, those remain, right? All those tactics and all those attempts and all those ways to keep people, to strip people of their power, those can't be impacted by all those things that they do, right? And so at the end of the day, we had a, a, an activist in Asheville who, who was involved with SNCC and was, you know, just a pillar in the community for a very long time, Isaac Coleman, and he passed away. But when I, he would always talk about how if, if folks weren't so concerned or intimidated by your power, why would they be trying to take it away, right? And just remembering that, you know, as you're talking to people. So you don't necessarily have to tell somebody, you know, you need to vote and you should vote, but your, if you can vote, that's a power that you have that some people are trying to take away. And remembering those, those forms of power that we talked about, those three ways of, you know, of, of, uh, of choosing, influencing, and holding accountable. This is, this is kind of a framing for y'all as you're talking to people about voting, right? Because we know uh, there's a lot of people here that know each other. We're all kind of <laughs> in the same circles in some way, right? Um, but these are things to remember. Uh, and, and so there's a few stories woven into this, um, you know, into this evening too, and this is one of them. So this, uh, this young man's name is Braxton. So did, uh, are folks familiar with the Charlotte Uprising that happened recently, right? So um, it, I was actually there at the Charlotte Uprising when the governor declared a state of emergency that was totally unwarranted, in my opinion, and in most, you know, most activist opinions, uh, because the things that were happening were peaceful, right? Um, so protesters were killed, which was not peaceful. Um, but anyways, this is, a, this is from the Charlotte Uprising, and this man Braxton is a cinema, cinematographer in Charlotte, and uh, that's him in front of the SWAT team, and that's him after he just won a city council seat, mm -hmm. right? So he began going to Charlotte Uprising, uh, taking video, and eventually started going to city council meetings because he realized the connections between how the city's responding to what's happening at the Uprising, um, and city council, and how they could have an influence or have something to do uh, with how things were being responded to. So, you know, long story short, Braxton started over here, began live streaming at city council somewhere in the middle, and then uh, through bringing in other people who typically weren't in those council meetings through Facebook and other avenues, he was able to build a platform for himself, run a campaign in the largest city in North Carolina, and win with no political experience as a young African American man. So. Um, that's a pretty exciting story, and again, we just say that all to say, this came about, um, you know, he was just an everyday person with no political experience. So a lot of times there, there are these uh, beliefs that people have to be, you know, really vested, or they have to be really rich, or all of these things, all these beliefs that we are encouraged to believe to keep more everyday people, right, out of political circles. So it's a combination of, um, you know, just being, being aware of, of the realities of campaign finance and how crazy it all is, and then knowing stories like this, right, and sharing stories like this, so that people um, feel they can, they can do something like this guy did. So if we can go to the next slide. Um, so again, what's on the ballot, we're, we put together this to just kind of be a little bit of an informational and, and motivational evening. Um, so, so from here, we're just gonna kind of move into um, what is on your ballot? We're going to talk a little bit more about the sheriff race, um, since the sheriff is on the ballot here, and then we'll move into our kind of moving around the room activity. Okay? So, <coughs> do folks here know what is on the ballot here <laughs> in, uh, in Jackson County before we go over the list? Sheriff? Clerk of Courts? The, the Clerk of Court, okay, yes. Board of Commissioners, some of them. Some of them, right? School board of Education. Yeah. School board, yep. State don't know, that's why I came. Sorry? I don't know, and that's why I came here. Okay. <laughs> State Representative? Senate? State Senate. Mm -hmm. All right. House of Representatives, right. Mm -hmm. So that's a pretty good list, and you all said all the ones that are going to be on there for the primary. Um, and there are more, right? So Senate's going to be later on. So we'll just, we'll recap this. So you have your, your U.S. House of Representatives, right? So they're the lower chamber, right, of Congress to work together with the Senate. Um, there also is, is uh, NC House, which is not going to be on this ballot um, in the primary. Um, the Board of Commissioners uh, will be on, you know, certain districts, depending on where you live, will be on um, the ballot. 
in the primary, the sheriff as well. A lot of people get confused about the sheriff because they're like, do I have to live in the city or the county? Yes. In the county? Yeah, everyone, the sheriff is working for everyone. So, um, Board of Education, and then the clerk of court, right? And so we have a couple sample ballots here, right? Maybe we can just pass those around so people can just take a look. Um, there's three different ballots, right? Um, so the the reason that there, does, does somebody want to share or know the difference between a primary or a general, or um, why some folks might be on the ballot now and not until later? Assuming we're picking who's going to run in the fall. Yes, that's right. A lot of people don't know that, you know? So that's that, that in and itself is saying <coughs> people don't know there's an election in 2018, and they don't know that there are two elections, and they certainly don't know why, right? There are two elections. So all you got to know is if there is no competition in a district for a seat, there's not a reason for them to run in the primary, right? Primaries happen when there's competition. That's why our primary ballots are shorter than our regular ballots, right? And then um, you, you had mentioned something about you know the judicial races. Again, the judicial primary was removed. There have been there's been a concerted effort um, to change the way that the judiciary is is uh, is elected in North Carolina. And part of the plan of changing that was actually taking away the primary. So po folks that are running for Supreme Court justice, um, they're they are, they are not going to have a primary. They're all going to be on the ballot in the fall. And, um, and so that's, that's something that's going to make our ballot even longer, right, in the fall. So just want to make sure folks are clear on that. And sometimes it's hard to explain to people. But I find that to be the easiest, is just saying, if there's not competition, they'll be on the ballot later. And so again, for your primary, the sample ballots are coming around. But these are, um, these are the positions that will be depending on your district, depending on your party affiliation, right? Uh, if you're unaffiliated, you can you can choose which ballot you'd like. But if you're registered as a Republican or a Democrat, you're only going to see who's running in your party, right? And if folks want to change that, they're going to have to do it during early voting, which starts on Sunday, because you can't show up on election day and decide to vote for a different party, right? So these are all good things to know if you're talking to voters. So, um, with can that, you uh, can you change how uh, you're registered from the primary? Can you change it in the general? Yes, you okay. certainly can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you just can't change it on election day. So, again, with early voting, there's what's called same day registration, right? So you can go, you can update your registration, you can change your party, uh, you can do anything, but up until election day, and then once you miss, once you're past uh, early voting, you're pretty much locked in to wherever you are at. Uh, with your original registration. So, cool. Any questions about the ballot? We're going to go in, we're going to, we're just doing a little preface right now. We're going to, in our game that we're going to play, we're going to actually go through all the different powers that these positions have. It'll give you more information, um, maybe lead to more questions. Just wondering, uh, is there a Democratic candidate for state Senate in District 50? 50. Against Jim Davis? Yeah, I believe so, yes. But not independent. But no, it's, that'll be decided through the primary. Is, is there, are there more than one candidate? Is there one, one there's, there's, there's a, look at the yeah. Democrat. The price. No, 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 that's, no, no, no. we're talking about Congress. Yeah. I'm talking about state senators. I don't think oh, so. State. Isn't it just coppers in the Democratic Party and oh, Davis? Yeah. And the, there's one on the Coppers, K-U-P-P-E-R-S, I think. Yeah. Oh, yeah, maybe. Those, those are not being contested. But That's there's not no yeah. partisan yeah. Contest. Yeah. contest. Unopposed, yeah. yeah. Um, cool. So just there's a little story here. Last night we did it with the role play. Um, <laughs> it's, it's just me, so it's going to be kind of hard to role play. So I'm just kind of going to go through what the example is. Um, but basically, it's called, it's called the story of Christopher, right? And the story of Christopher is meant to show the um, just the different ways that uh, things can unfold when law enforcement interacts with folks. And then and in Asheville last night, we talked about the district attorney as well, because we have the district attorney um, on our ballot. Um, but basically, there, there's, a, there's a young man driving in a car with a group of his friends, right? And uh, he's driving around at night, and a sheriff pulls the car over and asks them, um, 
you know, do you have any idea why I stopped you tonight? And la la la, may I search your vehicle, right? And Christopher is not aware that he can say no, right? That he can say, no, you cannot search my car. And so um, the officer finds marijuana in the car, right? A small amount. And uh, basically at that point, uh, depending on the stance of the sheriff, right? If the sheriff has a no, uh, you know, tough on crime, no tolerance approach, which I'm from Lincoln County, right? So we had a sheriff that had that stance, I can attest, and, and some friends I had in high school. Um, that, that means that, the, that that officer would arrest Christopher, right, and take him to jail, uh, and then from there, something would unfold with those charges. It's also possible that the officer could let him go, right? And if an officer lets him go, then that means he's not going to be taken to jail, right? There's not going to be charges pressed. And that's one example of how there's kind of a fork in the road, right, with the legal system and with law enforcement that comes back to the power of the sheriff. The sheriff is over the entire county. The sheriff has very significant powers to hire and fire, basically at their own accord, right? Much more power than, than the chief of police of a city would have. Um, and so um, we just, we kind of spell that story out just to remind folks that knowing, knowing the stances that, that the folks that are running for, for these positions take is really important. Knowing their background even, you know, if they're from around here, how are, what type of person, you know, are, are, they, are they known as? Um, all of these are, you know, questions that sometimes are answered by um, voter guides or forums, you know, if you hear of opportunities to, to go out and learn about who these folks are. Um, but, but again, we just tell that story to kind of show that trickle down. Um, the, the, just really quickly, the DA part of the story is that, and again, we did a role play, <laughs> Uh, and I was the DA last night, um, but but the DA has an immense power as well because once that if the, if the person is arrested and they're in the legal system, then there's an inter interconnection right between the the sheriff or the chief of police and the district attorney right because the DA is the one that then really executes the law in in, in terms of you know how it's going to impact the person who's been charged right. So in the story of Christopher, for example. Uh, say, you know, Christopher had, had, had not had a previous record, right? The district attorney could decide to throw the book at them and say, well, you still had it, so you're going to get this charge, right? You're going to get what, a misdemeanor possession. Or they could say, well, maybe they haven't had a record before, so I'll, they'll strike a plea deal, right? A prayer for judgment, for example, is something that in North Carolina could happen. So prayer for judgment means that if they, uh, if the person who got in trouble doesn't get in trouble for another year after that, that the charge goes away, right? Does anybody know what happens if they do get in trouble? It doesn't go away, right? It's a plea deal. So it's like if you say I'm going I'm to not get in any trouble and then you get in trouble, then the charge actually comes back and it's compounded with the charge that you received at the next point, right? And then, at, you know, as you all may know, if you have two charges together, it's worse than having one, right? So it's so that's an. But that was the example that we used last night. Was that this DA said, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna let this kid go based on him saying, I'm not gonna get in trouble again." And again, that's all based on who the, you know, who this person is, how their their personal way of thinking, their approach in working with the law. So we just tell those stories again to remind folks that, you know. It's more than just a campaign sign or, or, you know, who someone might know, but it's knowing like what these people stand for, especially in the, in the criminal justice lens, especially with you know, a lot of the things that are going on in our society today. Um, and it's just, and it's just simply asking questions or reading a little bit of information can go a long way with that stuff. Um, and we want to just highlight as well that you know a large part of the, the determining factors that are unsaid are, you know, obviously the, the race and the ideology of, uh, of the sheriffs and the DAs that are making these decisions right. Uh, the same race or ethnicity of the folks who are being charged or who, you know, who are yeah, in these situations with these folks. 
Uh, and then beyond just race and ethnicity is, is class and status, right? These are all, you know, implicit bias exists in all of these realms that, that interact. And uh, we just want to highlight that. Um, and if we can just cruise through a few slides here. Uh, there is one more story. So, so what power do they have? We've talked about that. And if you can keep flipping through that, sorry. Um, we talked about the power that they have. Sorry, these, these are all my visuals I forgot about. So this is Christopher. And if you can keep going, Henry Gaze and the sheriff. Then the next one's the DA, right? Um, and then there's this picture. So if you can stop here. So this is, this is the power that we have again. So, so even in instances where uh, folks may think a certain way because it's just always kind of been the case, for example, with Confederate monuments, right? There's a movement to remove Confederate monuments in the South. And some people uh, don't fully understand what that movement is about, right? Or what the roots of it are. Um, but it is a liberation movement, right? A lot of these Confederate monuments represent to some people, represent heritage is what folks say. But to a lot of people, they represent uh, oppression and racism, and in fact, are pillars of fascism, fas excuse me, in, uh, in our society today. So this is a photo um, showing the, the toppling of a Confederate monument. And I have this up here because uh, they're actually the district attorney in Durham. The district attorney in Durham had power on his own and had his own perspective and, uh, and perceptions of what this behavior was or how it could be dealt with. But folks organized, folks with nonprofit organizations and faith centers organized on the ground in Durham and actually convinced this district attorney to drop charges because people could be fined, imprisoned, all sorts of things for toppling down these monuments. But in Durham, the district attorney was convinced through people power, through influence, through organizing, to drop the charges on these people that were doing this. And so again, we just want to remind y'all that yes, they have the power, but again, we have the power too, right? Uh, cool. So um, with that, that was kind of the point where we broke into our game, right? So I've, I've been kind of talking a lot up here. This is a time for us to get a little bit more interactive and actually learn what some of these different positions around the room do. So what we did uh, was take the positions that are going to be on the ballot and, and tape them up around the room, okay? So we have county commission, clerk of court, sheriff, house of representatives, and school board member, okay? And then uh, Enrique took the liberty of mixing all of these powers up for us, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're, <laughs> we're gonna take all these, so I'll just start to pass these around. And so we'll, uh, that's okay. So these powers, what we'll do is take them around the room and we're gonna try to match them with the positions that you think that they go with, okay? And I think it's gonna work out to where everybody gets two, if that's okay. And so when you, when you've gone around and you feel like you found the found the position that aligns with your power, then you will take that power. <laughs> there you go. You'll take that power right by the position that you think uh, it aligns with. Okay? Does that make sense? Cool. I was going to put them on the wall. Yeah. So you can just tape them when you're ready. Just let me know, and I have some tape, and you can just tape it right beside the position that you think. Just take it. Sure, don't take it. Okay. Can we take them maybe okay. yeah, the closest sure. thing that's not actually paint? Okay. Maybe we can do that? Okay. What's the answer to take them? Who um, has the power to punish us if we take these walls? <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, yeah, it's probably yeah, me. Yeah, the yeah, needs to come to the closest. <laughs> A surface that doesn't actually involve paint. Yeah, just put it out. So yeah, just, if it's glass, it is okay. If it's wood, it's okay. Just stick it to the sign. Yeah, if you take it to the sign. On the sign. We put it on the sign. Yeah. Right. So we're easy. I'll give you the smallest pieces of tape. The, the, the least intimidating pieces of tape I can possibly. Okay. And this is difficult, so don't worry if, it's, if it seems hard, because that's kind of the point. Is that there's so many powers. How are we supposed to know? They're Adam and Eve. All right, let's go at the work of county commissioner. We're going to start with county commissioner. 
So can y'all help us by reading some of these powers? Y'all, like one of us read that Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. If one person could read one. I have the power to provide the local board of elections with funds for voting machines, poll workers, and tools for election administration. I have the power to adopt local laws, which are called ordinances, and to pass resolutions like ones opposing judicial gerrymandering. I have the power to own all of the public school buildings in a particular school system. And I have the power to set local property taxes and adopt a budget for a locality each year. So are all of those right? Is there one that seems out or off? Possibly I'm in the schools. Mm -hmm. But they probably do. Yeah. That, well, that's actually, it's, it, that goes with the school board. It does. Uh, actually. The school board on the all of the particular buildings in the school system. Really? Yeah, the, the county commission deals with funding, uh -huh. right, and, and figuring that out. But as far as the actual ownership, that number 28 goes, yeah, goes under. under school board. Oh. So I think it was originally over there, too. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, I, you know, that was. I put it up there and then I moved it over here. So it's kind of like the, when you do the yeah, exams and you have multiple choice. Yeah. Take the first one and don't change it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but all that makes sense to everybody here. So a lot of times you hear the Board of Elections directors talking about working with the county commission, right? Because that's directly related. And then the last night people were kind of confused about the ordinances, yeah. but it says like ones opposing judicial gerrymandering, right? So it's not saying the county commission is going to do anything about gerrymandering itself. It's just taking a stance, right? A localized stance on a larger issue. Okay, so they, so could a county commissioner or the board of them um, say, well, we're going to do something that actually encourages judicial gerrymandering? They could be in support of it, yeah. But they could denounce it, they could support it. Yep, good question. Cool. Good job. So we can, do y'all want to go to school board next? Since we kind of started over there already. Somebody want to read? Yeah, I'll read one. I have the power to adopt annual public school budgets for a particular system, but cannot, I cannot tax citizens. I have the power to hire and oversee the public school superintendent and the core academic curriculum for a local school system. I have the power to own all the public school buildings in the particular school system. Hmm. What does that mean, own the building? Yeah. yeah. The individual strange. members. So they, uh, well, the how does it? Kind of all all how could that intersect with power, right? Money and power. If they can't tax the citizens, they don't have really I think the control mm -hmm. over their that's why over their money. That's why I moved. Yeah. I really think the county owns. It seems like that's. I'm still stuck on that one. Yeah. Yeah, that one. It, it doesn't seem to make sense because that's what everyone thinks. That's kind of the point of the game is to be like, wow, that's crazy. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, but those are the those are the three that go with school board. Yeah. All right, so then to the U.S. House that represents the school board member it makes it sound like the individual rather than the board. Then the power to yeah. impeach right. and trial federal officers, including the President of the United States. So do it. I have the no, somebody else wanted to read that one. <laughs> but I have the power to make the nation's laws declare war and raise and spend the public money, although I've advocated some of that. <laughs> I share power with the executive branch led by the president and the judicial branch led by the Supreme Court. I have the power to approve some presidential appointments, approve treaties, and oversee some federal agencies. 
That's a lot of power. <laughs> yeah. Use it. Use it. Use it. <laughs> that, okay. Sheriff now. Sheriff, here we go. I have the power to operate correction, corrections facilities, detox centers, group homes, halfway houses, and work release programs. Mm -hmm. I have the power to supervise inmates, protect their rights, provide them with food, clothing, exercise, and medical services. I have the power to enforce money decrees, including wage garnishment, eviction notices, and the sale of property. I have the power to do routine patrols, manage traffic control, transport prisoners, administer the jail, and maintain safety and security in the court. I have the power to issue arrest and search warrants and take guilty pleas of minor littering, traffic, wildlife, alcohol, worthless check, and boating violations. Do all of those check out? I don't know. What about the last one? The boating. Uh, that one, yes. That one, yes. Mm -hmm. Earlier, I had, I had to place the one about the power to operate facilities, and I, I, I guess I get operate them, but I, I was hesitant to put it there at first. I was surprised that they had the group home and halfway houses, mm -hmm. at detox centers. I was like, really? A lot of people are surprised by that they one. were under social services. Or right, else. right. A lot of people, yep. And, the, and then the eviction one as well. Um, yeah. The so, the, so there is one that, um, there is the, this one actually with the voting violation is actually their clerk of court. This one's the clerk yeah, of court. Yeah, that one is the clerk of court. And so that means we are missing one from sheriff. So there's the one about warrants and subpoenas. What's on the, is there one on the floor? And oh, is that it? Yeah. That's probably the missing one. Yep. That's what Nello thinks about warrants and subpoenas. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so that, that's the one that. Well, you know, Marsha Kreitz, she works with the court system a lot, and she talks about how the sheriff's department is not very friendly towards some of the inmates. Mm -hmm. So the power to issue subpoenas, warrants, summons, make arrests, and extradite prisoners. The, I'm the only law enforcement officer to have jurisdiction throughout an entire county. So those are the five powers that the sheriff has. Among other ones, but these are the ones we're highlighting. So this section here. Who has the power or, uh, to create these? Facilities, detox centers, group homes, yada yada yada. Would that be? That's a yeah. collaborative between local funding, between a few different bodies. So it's not, for instance, county commission. Yes. Oh. They, they allocate money. It's commission, it's commission and council, right? That would be the main yeah, sources of determining the funding. Say the answer again. That the the commission and council would be the main local bodies that deal with parceling out the money. Uh, but they, they'll work together with other local agencies. Okay, like the county USS. and the, who's the council? The county commissioner or city council. City council, okay, the town, like the town, okay, gotcha. I forget which number. That was a good question, though. So last, last one, right? Clerk of court. Oh. I have the power over probate of wills and administration of estates of decedent minors and people with deemed incompetent. I have the power over clerical and record keeping duties for the district and superior courts. I have the power to hear a variety of special proceedings like adoptions, incompetency determinations, and partitions of land. And then there's the one that we brought over, right? Yeah. So is that correct? Yeah, voting violations. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was had to be like a magistrate. And then so the sheriff's department delivers them. So Having received some rights. Right, it's the issuing agency. Yes. Yes. So is the clerk of court, court a magistrate or like? 
No, they're not. Judges. No, they met. Are the those magistrates are, under the clerk of court? Mm, I don't know. Because if magistrates do that. I don't know if they're technically under. I think they work together. But the the and the, the magistrates kind the, of oh you know they're at a lot of different times at night. You know the clerk of court really drives the yeah. the administration of uh -huh. the legal. You know at the county level, it's like the nine to five always there, processing all the paperwork. But that's a good thing to bring up too. Yeah. But if somebody's in the ER in the middle of the night and needs to get committed, they call the magistrate. magistrate. Right. Exactly. And so that's like you know yeah. incompetence and stuff like that. Yep. So we've made it. We made it around the room with all of the different the powers and the positions. So y'all did a good job with matching that stuff up. So what were the what were the most surprising uh, things in here? Did anyone learn anything they were they were surprised by or didn't know about? I was surprised about the uh, school board member having theoretical ownership school building. Well, you would own it as a body. You, you as an individual. No, not, not, as, not, not, not as an individual, but even as a body. I'm mm -hmm. surprised that ownership lies within school. I didn't really know very much about what the clerk of courts does. And that's really being contested this time around. Because there are two people running on the Democratic yeah. side for that. And uh, so the primary will have that as part of what is to be voted on. I mean, the incumbent is being contested. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that, so you think that's kind of like a, it's a hot race? I don't know that, I mean. It's just I never happened. It's just never happened. It's never happened. Okay. Okay. <laughs> because the, there was the yeah. incumbent has been around for a long time. Okay. And that's, ha that's like happening across the state, you know. People that are a lot different than the people that have been playing those roles. Any of these other ones, y'all have been hearing anything like that about? Or you I just wanted know? to clarify because I wasn't paying enough attention when the ballot was going around. Mm -hmm. The sheriff, where it was being, there, there are two people, that's the Republican? I think. Mm -hmm. And so fine. does that mean Chip is running uncontested for Democrat? I believe so. Yeah. Okay. So but I'm not sure. determine who is I think one is going to be in. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. It seems um, I, I'm more aware now how a sheriff of a county really sets the tone mm -hmm. <laughs> for the county and how its citizens, residents will be treated. Um, and I don't know where the check or balance of power is there, but um, or if there is. There but really, yeah. I would hope so. There's oh, not much of a of a balance. It's not yeah, like, not not okay, not another elected mm -hmm. person I don't or think body. So. I mean the sheriff has, you know, the authority to to hire and fire. So like for example in Asheville, there was a leak of a video mm -hmm. that happened, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And the the um the chief of police was like, I mean I I can't just do what I want. I have to go through all these bureaucratic kind of processes and investigations and, and proving things to get to the point that the sheriff could just automatically be at because the sheriff can hire and fire anybody without question, right? Um, so there's not, that's one position where they're really just kind of historically, there's not a lot of checks and balances or safety nets or anything like that. It's just, just kind of an authoritative role. But doesn't the, the county funds the sheriff's office? If, if he right. wants to hire an extra uh, deputy, he's got to go through the county commissioners to. To get, right. to get the money yeah. to do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and does, so, so I guess that's one checking balance anyway, is, mm -hmm. is, is funding for the sheriff's. And, and did, is, is, is a sheriff's uh, salary predetermined or does that go county to county? I think it varies county to county significantly, yeah. Um. But they can, like, they have the power to fire all the deputies if they want to. If they're elected, a new sheriff is elected. Theoretically, he could get rid of all the deputies and get all new deputies mm -hmm. that think like him if he wanted to. Mm -hmm. And I know that, that they usually, they will go, deputy, deputies will go and change their voter registration mm -hmm. as soon as a new sheriff is elected to make sure they're in the party of the sheriff because it's wow. public record. And they, mm -hmm. 
Well, you think those are the things you hear. When you have yeah, them. but I, you hear these stories, and you think of the sheriff as being the most often corrupted yeah. office in all of these, and that mm -hmm. uh, the sheriff seems to have a lot of outreach, a lot of a real web of contacts throughout the community, mm -hmm. and is interfacing with lots of people mm -hmm. all the time mm -hmm. in the community, and um, so there isn't. There isn't a possibility for some real bad corruption. Yeah. Yeah. The reason that, that we, you know, did this again in closing is just to try to uh, break down a little bit more information. And did people think this is kind of fun, kind of interactive, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. It's it's better than like sitting in front of a PowerPoint the entire time, right? right. So, um, if, and you know, again, um, if you're interested in doing this again or with any other groups, like we're totally fine with people redoing this in your own spaces. You can request um, facilitator outlines for me if you want. Um, the power grid, I will email y'all um, the power grid and the Jackson County uh, electronic copy of what you have in your hand, just so you have that stuff and you, you know you can you can look it up on your own and use it. Uh, but um, I'll definitely get the, the paper ones out here too. So we were just encouraging folks to please take materials and please talk to people about the upcoming election. Um, what we will help you in a day. Do you have an office?